first you have to learn Chinese words. Uh, the key term that I'm using today, shan zhai, the first word there, um, that's the term I want to use to describe. Uh, sometimes an idea can suddenly catch on fire and rally a wide range of things and becomes a catch-all phrase that summarizes the spirit of the age. In this afternoon's presentation, I am hoping to use a historical Chinese term, shan zhai, that has become extremely popular in recent years to describe not only a specific Chinese mode of production in the IT industries, but also a specific Chinese mentality and emotional complex following the rise of China. Originally, shan zhai, the term, sorry, where's my remote there? Originally, Shan Jai refers to a common mountain village. Thus, you see the picture of a mountain and people climbing up to get the money. That's today's meaning. Uh, Shan Jai refers to a common mountain village or a mountain stronghold or a bandit fortress. Just by the double meaning, you know, it could be benign or it could be rebellious. Historically, that's the Chinese word. Historically, in times of utter social unrest or invasion by alien tribes, families or clans that were living in the same village or general area had been known to retreat into the mountains or lakes and build up fortresses to resist outside offensives, be they from invaders, bandits, or later from government forces when the fortresses became too powerful. The creation of such outlawed but communal, notice the, the terms, outlawed but communal forms of self-preservation and self-protection have striven for local autonomy throughout Chinese history. Of course, with only limited resources afforded by their defensive geographic location and pressed by an urgent desire for survival, these fortresses had also been known to sometimes resort to highwaymen or Robin Hood style robberies. The best known depiction of such Shan Jai fortresses lives on in the 14th century classic novel, Outlaws of the Marsh, that has left on its Chinese readers indelible impressions of nonconformity and criminality on one hand, but fraternity and heroism on the other. This will be key to understanding the concept of Shan Jai. Please bear such complex emotions in mind as you think of the term. The adoption of the term Shan Jai to describe China's innovative IT producers who may have started as copycatting, but has now moved increasingly into innovation and creative applications, thus cannot help but bring up allusions to this positioning at the margins or cracks of encroaching dominant powers and the mobilization of ingenuity to create optimal conditions for continued survival. Small-scale family-run factories in Hong Kong in the 1950s that produced inexpensive copycat products had been called Shan Jai factories to mark their position outside the official economic order. But today's Shan Jai producers are working within quite different investment and production contexts. Let me illustrate. One of the most dramatic stories in the world of technology in 2009 has to do with an iPhone left on a bar stool in Redwood City, California, which was discovered to be a next generation prototype. Considering Apple's watertight security, people's first reaction was, it must be a counterfeit or a clone from China. Well, as it turned out, it was the genuine stuff. But the easy conclusion that China could be on a par with Apple in IT technology was quite sobering. And when the new iPhone 4G was finally released in 2010, copycat models were already available in southern China at half the price. However, these so-called clones or copycats make up only the most mundane part of the Shan Jai mode of production that has come to epitomize China's economic and cultural vitality. The kind of Shan Jai that truly makes the IT giants worry is this kind. While you were still waiting for the name brands to come up with the rumored dual SIM card phones, Shan Jai producers are already selling triple SIM card phones, 
packed with many other exceptional functions good for international travelers who are using different types of frequency. Now, how did they become so powerful contenders in innovation? Well, the short answer is the capitalist mode of production is now creating its own rivals. Copycatting has been common practice in the developing countries where global name brand commodities maintain their luxury status through profit margins that put the vast majority of the people below the threshold of consumption. In other words, the more successful name brand advertising campaigns are, the bigger the market for such counterfeits, ranging from LV bags to Nike shoes. Yet, it is the information technology industries that the new way of Sanjai products has had the greatest success, ranging beyond copycatting and into innovative designs and creative applications. Why? How? Mere individual ingenuity of the Chinese entrepreneurs or their boldness in business tactics hardly explains this interesting development. More relevant, I believe, is the highly rationalized, flexibly configured, modular mode of production that the IT industries themselves have perfected in recent years, which effectively lowered the technological as well as capital threshold for independent small entrepreneurs to join the race for market. Also, the modular mode of production allowed such flexibility in design and conception that the small entrepreneurs ended up beating the IT giants. To understand this part, let me go back a little bit in the history of capitalist production. Since the creation of the Fordist assembly line in the 1960s, traditional concept of the manufacturing process has been based on a fixed design and the multitude of parts that are fitted together sequentially by workers gathered at the work site, arranged in the rationalized and integrated work process. In addition to the concentration of labor, the intricate complexities of production know-how, industrial design, and related technologies are all well-guarded properties of the company. Contemporary modular design in the IT industries, on the other hand, dissolves this concentration by reconfiguring the product into a group of independently functional modules produced with the help of these precision machines and tools. Each module is a self-contained assembly of electronic components and circuitry with clearly defined functions and standardized interfaces. The most common ones for the mobile phone, for example, include the power module, the LCD module, the camera module, the Bluetooth module, the Wi-Fi module, and so forth. With standardized interfaces, USB for our computers, modules of different powers could then be strategically selected and installed in combination with other function modules to create easy and frequent module changes. The production process is now rationalized to such an extent that contract manufacturing, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, contract manufacturing is widely practiced and the world's leading brands from Apple, Nokia, HP, Dell, Sony Ericsson to Motorola have all outsourced their productions to southern China where cheap but quality labor is ready on hand. It is the growing application of this type of flexible configuration that has transformed a pragmatic means of communication such as the mobile phone into a trendy gadget and fashion statement that works to galvanize not only the flexible production but also the flexible consumption of mobile phones. Hence, we see consumers hardly satisfied with owning one phone. In fact, among the younger generation, having multiple phones, each with special advantages in one function or another, one is good for going on the internet, one is good for cheaper rate, and varied deals with different phone carriers has become common stock. On a higher level of restructuring, to ensure continued and substantial profit in investment in an increasingly volatile economic environment where manufacturing has long lost its profit-making edge, major IT manufacturers are increasingly moving toward creating core technologies and long lifespan products that would better consolidate their competitive edge. 
Many chose to become fabless, F-A-B-L-E-S-S, -S, by outsourcing their silicon wafer fabrication manufacture to Asia's developing economies while building strategic partnerships that will concentrate on pioneering the design and development of innovative chip solutions for IC designs. The innovative system on chip that integrates the motherboard and the software on the same chip was designed by one such fabulous semiconductor company based in Taiwan called MediaTek. And this is the miracle chip. The chip has the capacity to be connected to different screens, memory chips, cameras, casings, keyboards, speakers, and other components or modules so as to produce mobile phones of varied functions and appearances. MediaTek's multimedia system on chip also makes it possible for music, camera, video, gaming, and more embedded features to converge within the same mobile phone. So long as the components and modules and MediaTek chips and other accessory parts are on hand, practically any manufacturer could put together its own model in any creative way as it sees fit. This development certainly encourages aggressive DIY producers to experiment with their own conceptions. And what was originally conceived to facilitate the multinationals' hold on the mobile phone market now turns out to be the last building block needed by local entrepreneurs who could now create Shanjai products to not only compete against name brands, but also open up new markets beyond the horizon of multinationals. Under this new flexible configuration of production and new global division of labor, it is increasingly problematic to identify Shanjai production as mere shameless counterfeiting. For the supply chain that multinational corporations depend on for their production is formed by the same group of component factories from which small manufacturers could buy the same components and the same MediaTek integrating chip to assemble their own new products. In the city of Shenzhen, where southern China, where most Shanjai producers are located, more than 30,000 companies now collaborate across the entire mobile phone value chain, designing products, sourcing, assembly, production, testing, packaging, distribution, and after-sale services. All legitimate business. One Chinese industrial inspector once expressed his frustration in trying to eradicate counterfeit products in the age of the modular mode of production. He says, quote, the whole production chain itself is completely legit, maybe until the very last few links, unquote. These last few links have to do with whether the products are subject to government testing and licensing, of course, with cost, and whether they eventually come to bear recognizable and registered brand names, which would then multiply the product's value. In other words, what ensures the distinction enjoyed by the so-called name brands is now less the unique function or nature or quality of the products themselves than their legitimation and protection by the state and the multinational corporations. Shanghai producers owe their competitiveness to another interesting twist that marginalized entrepreneurs effected on the capitalist logic of profit making. Monopoly capitalism's ambitious insistence on profit margin and market span tends to, ironically, make itself more conservative in product design and marketing strategies as it struggles to capture the greatest commonality in taste and marketability. Nothing eccentric, outlandish, or crass would be allowed to appear in their product lineup. After all, name brand models will have to sell millions of copies before the desired profit margin is met. But that also slows down the design turnover rate and weakens their competitiveness in the volatile market of personal electronics. Shanzai producers, on the other hand, have only moderate hopes for market share. With limited resources, they are much more aggressive in trying to locate new consumer populations through excavating what lies beyond the horizon of the mainstream in highly localized desires and needs. 
From the view of the mainstream, Shanjai phones may seem bizarre and crude, yet they fit in well with markets that have very strong local colors. This is a genuine phone, but also a genuine cigarette box. With China's 270 million smokers, a cigarette box phone would be quite convenient. It holds seven genuine cigarettes. Uh, cigarettes. For the name brands, functions and applications are only strategically selected for different models so as to maintain a constant flow of desire to switch phones for more functions or the functions that you desire. Yet for China, when men are beginning to acquire the habit of shaving regularly, a razor phone will certainly help. In contrast with name brands, Shanjai producers bear no burden in inventory due to their limited scale, nor do they need to be conservative about packing each model with as many functions and applications as the casings would hold and as they see the consumers might desire. So why not a cigarette lighter and a stunt gun on the same cell phone? For self-protection purposes. After all, regarded as a rogue production, Shanjai producers and the mobile phones they create have no obligation to limit themselves to behaving like the name brands. They don't need a copycat. They don't behave like the name brands. They can aim to beat the name brands. For business-minded people like you, this phone certainly saves the trouble of lugging around a projector. A cell phone that projects. You can do business anywhere. With the modular motor production and ready availability of a wide variety of components, new models can be created with bold and relentless appropriations of elements from the pop culture and topical events, making explicit references such as to Michael Jackson or Barack Obama. This, these two phones were created right after Michael Jackson's death and Obama's election. These Shanjai phones can beat the real thing in appearance, function, and value, while complaints about durability or quality are more than made up by the low prices. As the tension and competition between Shanjai products and name brand products continues to invoke in the eyes of the general public the hierarchical difference between original and copy, first world creativity and third world imitation, superb quality, mediocre or even poor quality, it easily taps into the complex feelings surrounding China's self-positioning in the narrative of the rise of the great nations and China situates itself at the end of the line, the newest rise of the great nation. Shanjai is criticized thus by many as reckless copycatting and poor quality imitation, nothing but immoral profit-making practices that upset market order, that suffocate genuine Chinese creativity and damage the image of China as it strides towards to surpass the rest of the world. Yet this cost-cutting mode of production has also succeeded in creating a uniqueness and competitiveness that obviously outperformed the advanced economies and are seizing the world market from the mobile phone to high-speed rail construction, a miracle that somewhat resettled the score between China and the imperialist powers that oppressed her. While for the middle-class-minded, Shanjai productions are shameless copies, testified by this multitude of counterfeit commodities and services that bear unwittingly, sometimes unwittingly, sometimes deliberately misspelled brand names, we don't know which one this is, or sometimes disfigured logos. Switch the letters around and you have a new product. I love this one best. Yet for the great majority of Chinese people who are more pragmatic than vain, sharing an approximate form of global name brand product at local price levels is quite acceptable and enjoyable. After all, lots of foreigners don't seem to mind it either as they flock to the Chinese counterfeit market to like the foreign investors take advantage of the savings in China. The disrepute of counterfeiting may be annoying to the Chinese state at times, but the immense material benefits of economic activities cannot be said 
to be unwelcome. While the practice and concept of Shanjai or innovative quadricatting strains the tension between China and its international investors, the wildly non-conforming, unlawful spirit embodied in the idea of Shanjai also tugs on the imagination of the Chinese masses and their historically sedimented relation to the state. And here lies the infectious cultural power of Shanjai. We're moving from material production to cultural production. Since CCTV, the official TV station, officially reported on the phenomenon of Shanjai production in the summer of 2008, many spontaneous parodies, jokes, satires suddenly took on new significance. Under the all-inclusive umbrella of Shanjai, they are read as teasing or even challenging the highly centralized Chinese political social structure. For example, there had been Shanjai Chinese New Year Gala, people's production of the state ceremony. Shanjai anchor person, Shanjai TV soap opera, Shanjai passing of the Olympic torch. In China, you have to go through a real rigid uh, selection process in order to participate in this very important process. But then people organize their own passing of the torch in order to share the honor of this once-in-a-lifetime glorious moment of China in 2008 when, when the Olympic Games were held in Beijing. And there could be Shanjai search engines. This was created in response to Google's withdrawal from China. The search engine combines all three popular search engines used by most uh, Chinese net netizens, uh, Baidu and Google and Yahoo, and they created Baiguhu. There's also Shanjai advertising or Shanjai stars. These Shanjai stars could draw out the crowds as much as the uh, genuine stars. And two familiar national symbols, Shanjai Tiananmen and Shanjai bird's nest. Uh, if you don't know that these are important establishments in Beijing. Beijing simply cannot monopolize people's desire to share the glory of the capital in their own localized sites. The uh, bird's nest, the national stadium, is built with bamboo in the countryside, southern China. As one Chinese commentator puts it, people at the grassroots level within the modern society where expanded economy allows greater freedom of speech are more inclined to rebel against the privileged few no longer willing to accede the moral standards laid down by their social superiors, they refuse to be told how to behave and demand their cultural, way, cultural say and the right to their own values and tastes. This is the social trend that Shanjai epitomizes. Significantly, such Shanjai displays are rarely staged with a straight face nor are they received with much of the seriousness of traditional political uprisings. And here it echoes Fernando's spoofs on commercials. In fact, Shanjai performances always bring on an atmosphere of light-hearted humor, mixed in with a pleasant sense of wonder and surprise, and oftentimes with a detectable sense of mischief. This comic style finds most of its inspiration from another strand of cultural production from the margins of China, that is, the Hong Kong film industry, in particular the works of Stephen Chow. Chow has developed his own unique comic style of Mao Lai Tao, which means from nowhere or making no sense, since the early 1990s, making frequent uses of puns, gags, jokes, and surprising anachronisms to poke fun at dominant cultural values through deliberate aping and mocking. By the mid-1990s, comical lines from Chow's film scripts had already reached cult status among Chinese netizens, generating numerous imitations and parodies on the internet, preparing fertile soil for experimentation with all forms of funny and outrageous parody. More importantly, the strength of Chow's comic style rests upon a total disregard of existing tastes, etiquettes, and manners. In fact, an insistence to be proudly outside the bounds of normal society. 
the most jokes surrounding farts and shit. This unabashed pride and energy in occupying the disparaged and non-normative position on the margins, when joined in with the heroic rebellion of the historical Shanjai rising in opposition to the state, produces interesting political undertones in emerging Shanjai cultural productions and stirring up ever more Shanjai imitations and productions. To equate Shanjai to mere cheap imitation or fake harmful product is to overlook the contagious desire to imitate, to parody, to surprise, to outperform that has become quite unique to contemporary Chinese context. Not to mention the immense productivity as well as subversiveness of the concept as it meshes into the delicate and developing realities of life in China. To reduce Shanjai to mere issue of copyright or intellectual property right infringement is to consciously overlook the significant change in our own mode of production and to ignore an opportunity to think through global capitalism and its possible stagnation through the emergence of Shanjai production. In a way, Shanjai serves also as a metaphor for China where much more than the world's factory, a once marginalized nation is now emerging from its communist mountain roots to become, <clears throat> sorry, to become a major player in world market as well as politics. However, the sentiments of Shanjai, of the unruly and the non-normative, may continue to have great effect on how the Chinese government and its people conduct themselves in relation to each other as well as in relation to the world around them. Thank you. Josephine Shan Chai, is it more uh, a humoristic way to um, have an internal revolution against uh, official politics or is it also a business model? Actually, Shanzai started as a business model. It's a mode of production that is dependent upon existing IT industry production, but it branches off into its own innovations and creative applications. Mm -hmm. It's only when Shanzai mode of production has created the Chinese economic miracle that the term was then taken over by the cultural productions, using that as aping what is happening in the state mm -hmm. or what is happening in consumption and using these uh, logos, famous brands mm -hmm. and changing things around, mm -hmm. creating a similar image but then sometimes I would say it may not be deliberately teasing or avoiding uh, intellectual property rights issues. Sometimes it's just people just don't know how to spell right. <laughs> okay. It's just a way of, you know, the stitchers, the people who are putting labels on, sometimes they switch things around. It happens everywhere. You know, English is not the world language uh, yet. And, and so it becomes a joke at the end. Right. But um, there is a serious part behind it. Is it also um, a platform for inventive products, really inventive products, not only changing the mm, letters or the signs or whatever, I think in cultural production you see more imitation or parody, but in IT productions you see real different applications. I didn't show you all the wild uh, Chantai productions. In the, in the Chinese uh, fields where, people, where peasants work, you need very loud speakers because if you leave your phones on the uh, side of the field and you work in the watery rice fields, sometimes you need very loud ringtones mm -hmm. to be able to hear. So there are phones, Shanjai phones, with uh, 7 to 27 uh, speakers okay. on a small phone. <laughs> and people have criticized that there are city, young people in urban areas would also buy this kind of phone. And when they're traveling in the streets, so just next to blaring the noise, yeah. your phone is ringing. So people complain about that too. But then for young people, it's much more fun to to, to play with this kind of innovative, unusual designs. Leaving now these jokey things, coming back to the Chinese way of understanding the world, 
Do you think this um, evolution that happens now in the moment is also a kind of revenge of an uh, important part of our world after 3,000 years of you know, development? Um, if you want to read it that way, but I don't think it's a de deliberate revenge. It's just yeah. the opportunities were there. The, the new mode of production mm. where you can switch things around, it presented an opportunity for the entre small entrepreneurs to take part in the marketing mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, the con contestations for the market. So they just simply used the capitalist mode mm -hmm. of production to its fullest extent. Many of my friends carry Shanghai phones because they are simply functionally um, more versatile. Mm -hmm. And it's more fun to use them. Um, coming back to your cultural side of mm -hmm. your studies, um, do you think that the Confucian way of seeing things gives a totally different approach to solve problems than we have in our Western countries? You could say that. I, I think the Confucian way has a very strong tendency toward pragmatism. Whatever works, mm -hmm. whatever will produce the desired mm -hmm. result. We first analyze a problem, then we find the solution and then we start to uh, work in this direction. The confusion way is... We would do the same. No, you, you do it in a little spot and then yeah. you see if it works. And if it works, you grow right. um, and you it, it's a, maybe, use it in Maybe pragmatism ways. on a different scale. Mm -hmm. I think it's a totally different approach. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that China will, after this economic power, become a military power as well in the next years, coming back now to the more geopolitical uh, um, ways? I don't think it will become a military power. It is a military power. Mm -hmm. you kidding? <laughs> the 400 missiles directed at Taiwan all the time. So we consider it a military power. And do you think it's a military power towards the West as well, and not only to Taiwan and... Um, just the oh, it depends on how the West treats it, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the Chinese way of thinking, you maintain a certain positioning and power so that you will not be threatened. Mm -hmm. And right now, I don't see China using the militaristic language that's as much the, as it did before. Mm -hmm. That's because what I, I meant. That's the pragmatic way. It was, the start was an economic growth, and now it's becoming a kind of... Um, self-finding military power. To be pragmatic, it's, it's much better to, to own the market than mm -hmm. to have to fight. Mm -hmm. So I think right now, Chinese merchandise and Chinese production, um, I just came from Singapore, uh, Singapore construction of the, uh, the subway, mm -hmm. or hiring Shanghai companies to do it. And I heard China's uh, high-speed rail companies are producing for the world. So technologically and economically, they are already mm -hmm. uh, making its presence known. So mm -hmm. they, they don't need to use muscles, but they'll maintain that. It's, a, it's, it's also very important to maintain stability, as we have talked about the earlier. The fact is that more and more Chinese students are among the best at the U.S. universities mm -hmm. all, yes. all over the world. Um, are these investments um, in elite universities in China also a way of becoming not only a copy-paste co um, country, but a real innovative new um, economic power? Um, I think at the same time you need to look at how many foreign students are now in China at the same time. So the flow is both ways. So there are also a lot of people learning uh, from China its ways of doing things. So instead of saying that China is now learning from the West and in handling things, at the same time we're seeing China exerting its influence internally. When do you think will China be more innovative than the Western countries are? I think to get the step even more in this direction. Um, as I have mentioned in my talk, uh, Taiwanese IT producers are contributing a lot to uh, the China's IT industries. And with the help of uh, Taiwan's IT producers, I think uh, the innovation is coming very, very fast. Mm -hmm. so because Taiwan has made its, inter its industrial upgrading 20 years earlier already. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Are there, yes, um, some more questions from your side? Yes, uh, I have to 
ask you a, perhaps a little bit a critical uh, question. I hope it's okay. Um, because you call it the rise of a great nation. And um, yeah, it is def definitely rising. But what I don't understand, or what we don't understand, especially in Norway where I, where I come from, is why aren't the people allowed to speak free about this great nation, if it is such a great nation? I mean, we saw that with the, you know, I'm from Oslo with the Nobel Peace Prize and everything, and we saw the reaction. And we were really, I mean, um, well, it was a kind of a wake up for us. The second question is, you call the, uh, Shang, uh, the Shanghai uh, is an innovative system. But what's the difference between that and what the Japanese did in the 60s? Because that was exactly the same thing, wasn't it? Thank you. Was it really the same thing? Well, let's start with um, the uh, first question. The first question. Uh, I didn't call it Rise of the Great Nations. Rise of the Great Nations is a state-sponsored television series that tracks all the, the rise of the great cultures from the great empires of the past all the way down to the rise of China. So China is situating itself within this narrative of great nations, seeing that its time has come. Now, China has maintained stability by stamping out uh, dissent. We all know that. But most people tend to agree that it is necessary to maintain stability. Maybe it also has something to do with confusion mm -hmm. frame of mind that you maintain peace in the family and there will be prosperity. Um, as to the Nobel Prize giving thing, there was also a strong debate within China itself concerning giving the award to a person who buys into only the Western ideas of democracy rather than a more local ideas of how people can live together and have their own way of life peacefully, rather than the Western ways of elections and you know, the, the usual democratic events. So there are a lot of people were reading um, the uh, recipient's statements and saying this is only buying into the Western ideology and Western models of democracy, while Chinese should have their own way of socialism, their own way of democracy, their own way of arranging for their own society. China has always maintained that unique, uniquely Chinese mm -hmm. idea well, within this, its, its this thought. This can be an opinion, but why do you put then the people into prison? That's uh, the second question. You can still have the um, opinion, but um, don't have to do it. Right. But maybe this is the time to switch to my other cap. People are put into prison for many different reasons. I think most of you are concerned about people put, being put into prison for political reasons. But even in the most democratic, democratic countries, there are a lot of people who are put into prisons for other reasons, such as sexual reasons. Uh, sexual knowledge and sexual information, access to that on the internet is enough to put people in prison in Taiwan. And you call that uh, democracy, and we pride ourselves on the fact that we are a democracy. But in relation to sexual language, sexual information, there is no freedom in Taiwan. So if you value political issues over other issues, such as sexual mores or other things, then you'll be seeing political dissent as being oppressed, but you're ignoring all the other things that are being stamped out. Mm. So I will not privilege uh, political dissent, because I, I don't think that is the only difference within society. There are many other people who hold different styles of life, different values, and they're still under uh, repression. So I, I wouldn't say Western democracy allows enough freedom yet. So I will not hold it up as the, the, the you know, the The, the only the way of explaining things. We strive freedom. for more freedom in mm. different spheres, politically and sexually and gender related in many other ways. Coming back to the second question, um, is China repeating somehow the history of Japan um, 40 years ago? I think 
on the surface you will see a similarity. But then I think the mode of production is quite different then. Because for, for the 1960s, in the Japanese mode of production, there's not that much of an interchangeability that is going on. Right now, we don't talk about parts anymore in the IT industry or in the electronic, the uh, uh, recreational electronics market. People talk about modules. Uh, the creation of the module-oriented uh, production process will reduce uh, labor level, will reduce uh, the expertise needed. For example, I have a um, LG refrigerator. One time, the temperature is not right, and I asked somebody to come and fix it. That person didn't have to know anything about LG compute, uh, uh, refrigerators. All he has to do now is which part is not functioning, and then he doesn't have to do anything. He went home and he ordered a whole part, this big part, and put it in. That's the temperature like control part. Module. Right. The workman does not need to possess any kind of skill anymore. So the de-skilling, in a way, is taking mm -hmm. uh, place at the same time. So it, history... All of these different mm -hmm. areas of, of impact, the module-related production, how it impacts the workforce, how it impacts the production, mm. is still waiting for more research. History can feel a bit similar, but it's always different because society yes. developed a new processes of production um, are in our time more important than they have been or didn't exist 40 years ago. Um, Gibt es noch eine Frage jetzt von Ihrer Seite? Um, could you just ask one question please and then we can proceed? Yeah. Well, I won't go into a big debate. I guess it's not the time and place for that. But uh, still, you, you mentioned that, you, that uh, the Chinese people are more concerned about stability. But I don't understand that. We have had stability in Norway for about 1,000 years now. We have democracy. I don't see that there is any you know, conflict between stability and democracy. Well, <laughs> we, we just make the uh, answer short. And perhaps this is really a discussion you have to maybe one lead sentence. Uh, by each other. Uh, before the present time, China has always felt itself isolated and pressured. Mm -hmm. Maybe Norway didn't feel that. Thank you very much, Josephine. You're Thanks very welcome. a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.